copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Calling all cars, attention all cars, attention all Contra County, Contra Costa County Sheriff's cars, broadcast 117. All cars pick up any person attempting to pawn watches or diamonds or having blood stains on the clothing. Such a person may be the murderer of Harry Whitted, a jeweler of Crockett, who was murdered this morning in his store. That's all. starts in Northern California, where two of the largest cities, Oakland and Berkeley, specify that all police, fire, and emergency cars must use Rio Grande cracked gasoline exclusively. The play ends in Phoenix, Arizona, where all sheriff's cars of Maricopa County are also powered by Rio Grande cracked gasoline. In fact, everywhere it is sold, Rio Grande cracked gasoline powers more police and emergency cars than any other brand. Leading cities specify Rio Grande because their tests have proved that the exclusive, fastest cracking process makes the liveliest, fastest, and most powerful gasoline. Rio Grande's cracking actually breaks up the atom so that every drop burns without waste. And now Rio Grande has added extra refining processes which extract all lazy, sluggish elements from cracked gasoline, leaving concentrated energy. These costly extra processes give Rio Grande Crack the extra speed and power which you know as police car performance. Although it costs us more per gallon to make this finer gasoline, it costs you no more. And now it is our great pleasure to present Sheriff Miller of Contra Costa County, who will speak to you from the studios of station KFRC in San Francisco. Sheriff Miller. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Much of the work of catching a criminal is just that. Work. Hard work. Days upon days of it. Work that is done in quiet, undramatic offices. Work that comes off the mimeographing machine, and that is done through mi microscope. Work that takes the form of countless questions on scores of worthless leads. It is often discouraging, tiring, brain-breaking work. But there is one thing which cheers the peace officer. No matter how low his spirits may drop, and that is the knowledge of the fact that sooner or later the criminal must meet his accounting with the law. The knowledge of the truth of the truism. Crime doesn't pay. Listen carefully to the story you are about to hear. See what happened to this man who committed murder and escape, leaving behind him no tangible clue. Escape with thousands of dollars are valuable. Listen carefully to his story. See how he profited by his spoil. And note the circumstances under which he was captured. And then, 30 minutes from now, ask yourself if you honestly believe that crime can ever pay. Sheriff Fields speaking. Oh, 
you know the party's wife? I don't know. She's under the sheriff now. Where is the body, Constable? Back here in the optical room. Has the doctor seen him? Yes, Sheriff. I made a hasty examination. What did you find, Doctor? He has three deep fractures of the skull, any one of which could have caused death. And as you see, he's been nearly decapitated. Find any clues, Constable? No fingerprints at all, Sheriff. There's a lot of stuff stolen, though. Did you get an inventory of the stock? Probably can't. Well, I don't know. Harry was very careful about keeping books. Yes, but he's dead. Who would know about his business? Well, there's Mrs. Withers. Has she been notified? Not yet. I was waiting for you. Well, you've got to notify us what's happened. Right away. Oh, wait just a minute. Remove the body to the coroner's office first and clean up the blood. No use in needlessly torturing the poor woman. Yes, sir. While you're taking care of that, Constable, I'll flash the state teletype and the radio to look for a suspect with blood-stained clothes. Teletypes, the news of the crime is carried to every police officer in California. Special railroad agents are notified, and the state highway patrol throws a cordon of armed officers around Contra Costa County. Meanwhile, the constable Meany goes the painful task of informing Mrs. Whitted of her husband's murder. The gentle lady, prostrated with grief, nevertheless manages to pull herself together when the constable explains that the officers are in need of her help in their work of apprehending the killer. A little while later, she accompanies the constable to her husband's store. Sheriff, this is Mrs. Whitted. I appreciate your coming down at this time, Mrs. Whitted. I hate to have to request your assistance, but every moment counts. Yes, I understand, Sheriff. I'm quite willing to help you, although I don't know what good it will do with how it gone. Well, we must do everything we can to catch his... Uh, the criminal. Was he? Did he? Did he die quickly, Jerry? Oh, oh, was he insane? I'm sure he died quickly, ma'am. Uh, uh, why can't I see him? The constable said you gave him Just a matter of form, ma'am. He's a foreigner. An autopsy, you know. You may see him soon. He, he was all I had, Jerry. All I had in this world. Yes, ma'am, I, I understand. <laughs> Now, if you would just answer a few questions, Lord. Yes, of course. Uh, I'm sorry, Sheriff. Now, apparently, many things have been stolen from the showcases, and the safe has been rifled. Yes, yes, there are several things missing. I can tell. Right there in that tray was where my husband always put the watch with the hunting case. It, it was a good watch, but nobody buys hunting cases anymore. I guess he had that one in stock for 15 years. Yes, yes. But what we want to know is, Mrs. Whitted, did your husband keep an inventory of his stock? Is there any way of telling what is gone? Oh, oh yes. There is a ledger in the safe with every item in it. Yes, yes, here it is. There, there it is. Here are the rings, for instance. The mate. Size and weight of the ring are entered here. And these marks correspond with the marks my husband put on the inside of every ring. So far, they could only be read with a magnifying glass. Then, when the ring was sold, he always wrote the word sold in this column. Hmm. Then it will be possible by checking the remaining stock against this book to know exactly what merchandise was stolen. Yes, yes I guess it will be. Well, I must say, Mr. Hooded kept very thorough books. Yes, Jerry. My husband was a very thorough man. Well, Mrs. Whitted, if you don't mind, we'll check over the stock right away. Every moment counts, you know. And so the widow of the murdered jeweler checked her husband's stock with the sheriff, choking back the tears as piece by piece recalls some intimate detail of her life. Some recollection of an association abruptly and permanently terminated. It is a ghastly task. But the brave woman sees it through, and hours later the sheriff is in possession of his first real clue, a complete list of the stolen goods. That afternoon, he checks with his deputies at headquarters. Well, boys, I'm having a list of stolen goods mimeographed. And by tomorrow morning, it will be in the hands of the pawn shop details of every police department in the state. There ought to be our biggest single help. 
Sooner or later, this guy will have to pawn some of the stuff. What makes you so sure it's a one-man job, Lancaster? Well, I just have a feeling it was. I don't know why. Pick up any dope when you were questioning British acquaintances? Nothing of any value. It was well thought of in Crockett. Didn't have any enemies that I could find out about. Strange thing. What's a bloody, vicious murder? I can't understand it. Well, I can tell you one thing. We're going to have a job on our hands after we catch the guy. Why? The people over in Crockett are in an ugly mood. They're talking about lynching. Oh, let them blow off steam if it makes them feel better. But I can assure you, Lancaster, there won't be any lynching. Not while I'm sheriff. More than two weeks passed by while the citizens of Crockett cool off. And no news is heard from Sheriff Beale's list of stolen goods. Seventeen days after the crime, the sheriff prepares a second list and broadcasts this one to every police department in the United States. But still, there's no reply. And then, 26 days after the murder, the sheriff calls Deputy Joe Joseph into his office. Joe, some of our stolen goods in that footed murder has shown up at last. Good. Who is it? Los Angeles. I just got a wire from Chief Steckle. They picked up a ring and watch that were pawned at the Castle Loan Company. I want you to go down there and find out all about it. Yes, sir. I'm on the way right now. Next morning, Joe Joseph interviews the proprietor of the pawn shop in Los Angeles. I want to look at that ring and watch you're holding for the police department. And who are you? Deputy Sheriff Joseph of Contra Costa County. Oh, yeah. They said you was coming in. Well, here's the stuff. When were they pawned? Mm, uh, December 20th. Who pawned them? Well, the fellow signed the pawn ticket, Johnny Gomezino. I gave him six fifty for the ring and the watch. What did he look like? Oh, he's about 35, I should say. Five feet, ten or eleven inches. Good-looking guy. He has curly hair. American? No, maybe a Mexican or a mulatto. Okay. Now we're doing these things. I want that pawn ticket he signed. Oh, yes, sir. Here's a six fifty. Oh, thank you. I'll just wrap these up for you. Oh, there you are, Joe. Glad I caught you. Oh, hello, Eddie. Captain sent me down to tell you they just turned up another ring from your list at a pawn shop over on Broadway. Fine. We'll go right around there as soon as I get this back. Uh, what name did the man use who pawned this ring? Well, let me see now. It is right here on the pawn ticket. Uh, Mike have you lost? Hey, let me see that ticket. All right. Mm-hmm. All right. I'll redeem the ring and take the ticket with me. What did this Mike Avillas look like? Well, I'll tell you. He might be a Mexican. I don't know. He was a good-looking fellow with black curly hair, but uh, he was 35 years old, I think. Well, I guess he was about five years old. So you've got a pretty definite identification from those two pawnbrokers down in L.A., Sheriff. And I've experted the handwriting on the two pawn tickets, and the names Johnny Gomezino and Micah Phillips are in the same handwriting. Sure. I'll run off another list of stuff, including a description of our suspect. I knew he wouldn't lay low too long. Sheriff Vale speaking. Sheriff, this is the constable of Los Gatos. Yes? Please, there's a bus driver by the name of Caldwell on the run between Santa Cruz and San Jose. He bought a watch listed on your circular. Hmm, that's fine. Where can we find him? Okay, Constable. Thank you very much. Joe, I want you and Bill and Dick Stockland to go down to San Jose. Find a bus driver by the name of Caldwell who's on the Santa Cruz run. He's got one of those watches. Okay. Now we'll get the boys and we'll get started. Right well, the manager of the depot says that Caldwell is due in from Santa Cruz any minute. Ah, does he know anything about the watch? I didn't ask him. Yeah, right here. Elsie. Yeah. 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 Y
to ride the bus now and then. Offer it to me for eight bucks. This watch is worth over 50. Did you suspect anything when they offered it for eight? No. Only I was afraid it wouldn't pass the railroad inspection. He said it would. So we took it across the street to the jewelers, and he said it was okay. When I asked the boss to give me an attack, Anything else on this bird? 
And I want you to get over to Miss Ted and see what they know about him over there. Okay. Next morning in Merced, Deputy Joseph looks up his old friend, Officer Louis Frago. Hello, Louis. Well, Joe, what the devil are you doing down here? A oh, little official business. Yeah, yeah. Sit down. Yeah, here, have a cigar. Thanks. Your business anything I can help you with? Yes, it is, Louis. Uh, shoot. You know a fellow from around here by the name of Dan Drosh? Dan Drosh? Sure, I know him. He was born right here in Merced. I've arrested him plenty of times. Yeah. He never had a break in life. Father was a Negro, mother a Mexican. Mother died when he was a baby and left him to shape pretty well for himself. He's been mixed up in a lot of small jobs, robberies and the like. Not a dangerous character, though. I'm afraid you're wrong there, Lou. Looks like he's a murderer. What? Dan, a murderer? Oh, oh no, Joe, you must be wrong. Well, yeah. we got good reason to suspect he's the fellow who killed that old jeweler up in Crockett last month. Mm-hmm. Well... It just goes to show you can never be sure. Where can I get a look at his record, Lou? Well, they got it on file at the sheriff's office down in Fresno. But I can't help feeling you will find you wrong. Why well, always look upon Dan and the children in court? Dan Deputy Joseph rushes to Fresno, obtains a copy of the criminal record of Dan Gross, and returns to report to Sheriff Field in Martinez. Well, Sheriff, I think we've got an identification at last. Fine. What is it? A man named Dan Droach from Merced sold that watch to the bus driver in San Jose. His signature on the hotel register and the signature on his criminal record, which I got in Fresno this morning, tallies with a handwriting on all his pawn tickets. Now just look at this record. Petty larceny, robbery, forgery, grand theft, reform schools, county jails, penitentiaries. And here's his picture and complete fingerprint classification. Well, at last, we've got what we're looking for. I'll get out new sectors describing this man as a murderer, and I'll have them in every police station and post office in the United States and Canada by the end of the week. We sometimes wonder how much attention people pay to those men-wanted circulars. Well, uh, this time, I'm going even further. How's that? I'm going to have the story of the murder and these pictures set up and make maps from them. And I'll send those maps to every newspaper in the country asking them to give the story prominent space. That's a good idea. I'll make a policeman out of every man, woman, and child in this country. But I'm not going to stop until I send this word where it belongs. The newspapers readily comply with Sheriff Field's request for cooperation. But it is not from some distant point that his first assistance comes from the public. It is from his own hometown of Martinez. For the morning after the story appears in the papers, Mrs. Frances E. Upton, proprietor of the Upton Hotel, calls upon the sheriff. Sheriff, I read about that murder in last night's paper. Yes, Mrs. Upton. Well, that man registered my hotel on December 2nd, while my night clerk was on duty. Are you sure? Yes. My night clerk recognized him from the picture in the paper. He checked out the next morning, and then that night... The night of December 3rd? That's right. The night of December 3rd, he checked in again while I was on duty. Now, I know it was the same man. Only the first night, he gave the name of A. Randall. Second night, he signed the name of G. Oliveira. Uh, did you bring the register with you? No, I didn't know you'd be wanting... Oh, well, it. never mind. I'll send a man over to your place to look at it. I want to compare those signatures with some others I'm collecting. If you're positive that this is the man, Mrs. Upton... Then you've helped us a great deal. This places our suspect within seven miles of the scene of the crime the morning it occurred. The signatures on Mrs. Upton's register do closely resemble the handwriting of the signatures on the pawn ticket. And Sheriff Beale is now absolutely convinced that Dan Grosh is the murderer. But despite the constant vigilance of the police, despite the ceaseless work of the deputy sheriff, Week after week goes by and no trace of growth. Then, one chill February dawn, two shabbily dressed men are shuffling along the deserted streets of Phoenix, Arizona. I tell you, Dan, this life's a bunk. The cops kick you out of El Paso and a brakeman kicks you off a train in Tucson. The cops kick you out of Tucson, and the shack kicks you off at Phoenix. I wonder how long it'll be before we get kicked out of Phoenix. Oh, I don't care. 
I wouldn't care about anything if we could only get some grub in me. Yeah, maybe if we got something to eat, we wouldn't be so cold. Yeah. You know, Dan, we ain't dumb. Why don't we team together and knock over a bank or something? Then we could eat for a while. Uh, hot dough don't stick with you. What do you mean? Oh, I don't know, but I pulled a job a couple of months back. Got away with a nice poke full of hot jewelry. But it never done me no good. What do you mean? Oh, I pawned a few pieces and then I figured I was hot. So I started to tell Paso and I went into an old pal of mine. I used to know in the big house. You know what that dirty so-and-so done? No, why? Well, while I was sleeping one night in the jungle outside of Lawsburg, New Mexico, he swiped my poke and took it on the lamp. Can you imagine this? The dishonest rat. Yeah. Hey, Harry, look. What? Right. There's a bread wagon standing in front of that grocery store, and the driver's going around back. Let's uh, swipe ourselves some breakfast. Okay. You keep your eyes open for the driver, and I'll smash some buns. All right.
narrator, Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company. <laughs> <laughs>